junkyard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true story of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The broadcasts are presented for the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research is from Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now the voice of Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the caretaker of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum. Good afternoon. I have here from our file number 198920, a rusted lock complete with handle. Once it was brightly nickel-plated, both handsome and utilitarian. Now its beauty has been completely destroyed by the effects of a very hot fire, and its usefulness is ended by the fact that it is locked. Some of its parts have been fused by the heat which it endured. It's part of the right-hand door of a motor car, the door next to the driver's seat. It was locked before the fire. I should like you to meet Chief Inspector Albert G. Clark, who is known as all Clarks are as Nobby. The 5th of November, 1605, was the day set by a certain Guy Fawkes to touch off a number of barrels of gunpowder he had secreted in the vaults under the Houses of Parliament, thereby blowing the members of the august body, complete with King James I, through the roof. Unfortunately for Mr. Fox, and happily for the monarch, a Lord Monteagle learned about the enterprise and flung Master Fox into a dungeon from which he emerged only to be hanged. Thus, the principal form of celebration of Guy Fawkes Day on the 5th of November is the kindling of cheerful bonfires in which effigies of Guy Fawkes and other gentry are burned to the accompaniment of hilarious noises. Quite late in the evening of the 5th of November, 1930, quite another type of bonfire made history near H Hardingstone, which village is quite near Northampton. This is the way they related the story. My name is Spiller, John Thomas Spiller. My friend here is Victor Charles Espinwall. It wasn't truly really the 5th of November. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning of the 6th. But it was still close enough to be practically Guy Fawkes Day. Be still, John Thomas. We were walking home from a Guy Fawkes dance in Northampton. Ardingstone is only a step from Northampton. You walk along the main London road from Northampton till you come to the turn-off to the left on Hardingstone Lane. Only about two miles. Two miles. First, as we started to turn off to Hardingstone down the lane, a motor car passed us. Going towards London? Very fast. Blinding us quite. Aye. And when it got past us, we saw a man. The moon was quite bright. So we could see his face quite well. He hadn't any hat. He climbed out of the ditch onto the metal road. And he looked as if he were mixed up wasn't sure what he was doing like. And we gaped at him. Didn't know what to say either. And it was just at that precise second I saw the blaze round the bend. Down Hardingstone Lane where there shouldn't be any blaze. And I said to John Thomas here... What's the blaze, you said? And the man from the ditch... The man without a hat. He said, it looks as if someone's having a bonfire. A late bonfire, he said. Yes, that's right. And we turned to look in the direction of the blaze... Down the lane toward Hardingstone. And when we turned back to look at the man... He was running away. Hurrying away. That's right, hurrying away. He didn't say a word. He started toward London, and then he stopped and looked around. The moon was so bright... And then he turned toward Northampton, and he started to hurry that way. We'd have done something, but he was hurrying down the road... Anyway, we didn't care who he was. And there was the bonfire. We just thought it was a bonfire, Victor. Yes. And so we went on down the lane to see who made the fire. And the fire seemed to be getting bigger, so we hurried. Hurried, and suddenly there it was. Right 
there in front of us. Blazing like, like blazes. The flames were 15 feet high. But we could see what it was. It was a, a motor, motor car. car. And there was somebody in it. In the driver's seat. And he was on fire too. He was dead. <laughs> The boys had forgotten about the hapless stranger who climbed out of the ditch and ran away. They went for a policeman. Quite a number of men arrived. The fire was clearly visible in the village, of course. And presently it was put out and only sizzled. The unfortunate occupant of the driver's seat was carried away in several sacks and put away to cool in the cellar of the local hospital. Then the two boys remembered the man without a hat and they told Sergeant Moody about it. Sergeant Moody was the bald-headed one from Northampton. He wasn't very old, was he, Victor? About 35. 36, I was thinking. 35. He looked like a commercial traveller. He had no hat. Victor, we said that. He seemed confused, I think I'd say. Wouldn't you, John Thomas? Bewildered, I'd say. He finally went off toward Northampton. He started the other direction first, though. Toward London. But you went down the road toward Northampton. A dark man. Needed a haircut. Wore a checkered waistcoat. And a dark red tie. He had a tiny black moustache. And a wart on the left side of his neck. A cut on his right hand. Limped. His right foot. Bulgy eyes. Pop eyes. Tall. Weighed about eleven stone. Would you know him again, Victor? Certainly I'd know him, John Thomas. It was all very suspicious, Sergeant. Now him running away like that. From the fire? I think he had something to do with it. I think you ought to find him, Sergeant. Sergeant Moody and the rest of the Northampton police made quite a point of trying to find the hapless stranger that day, but he wasn't to be found. By mid-morning, both the burned car and the burned victim had cooled off enough for a closer examination. There wasn't enough left of the men, they had decided it was a man, to tell anything about him. The car proved to have been a Morris Minor saloon, and the registration plate, though badly burned, was still legible. Sergeant Moody. I put in a trunk call to County Hall, Westminster, in London, to check the name to which that number was issued. We'll have it for you in half a second, Sergeant. That was MU-1468, wasn't it? Uh, MU-1468, yes. That's a London registration, according to the book. Quite. We'll have it for you in... Ah, here it is now. The name is Paget. Donald Patrick Paget. Address, Buxted Road, Pinchley. The car is a Morris Minor Saloon. Was, you mean? Uh, Donald Patrick Paget, Buxted Road, Finchley. Thank you very much. I then consulted the London Metropolitan Telephone Directory in the Northampton Station to discover whether a telephone number was listed for the name Paget in Buxted Road, Finchley. It was. I spoke to a woman who identified herself as Mrs. Pamela Paget, wife of the owner of the car. I broke the news to her as gently as possible, and she announced her intention of proceeding to Northampton. She arrived the same day, the 6th of September. I came as quickly as I could, Sergeant. Where is he? Uh, the, the, the remains are in the hospital mortuary, Mum. I suppose I couldn't see him. Well, I'm afraid I must advise strongly against it, Mrs. Paget. I, I'm afraid he'll be... Trifle difficult to uh, identify. I'm not easily shot, Sergeant. Oh, well, yes, ma'am, but uh, perhaps it would be better to wait until you've rested. Uh, I could have a nice cup of tea sent in for you. No, thank you, Sergeant. Good hot tea? Thank you. Perhaps you could tell me how this thing happened. Uh, well, uh, we don't know a great deal about it ourselves as yet. It happened only this morning, and uh, we've not... Well, we've only completed our preliminary examinations. 
We thought perhaps you might shed some light on the matter. I'm sure I can't. Uh, you and the late Mr. Paget were on good terms, of course. We were. Of course. Uh, what was Mr. Paget's occupation? He was a commercial traveller. Commercial traveller. I must notify the people he represents. And the insurance companies? Yes. Yes. I... I suppose Mr. Paget was alone when this happened? Well, there was nobody else in the car when... Uh, at the time of the fire, Mum. but... Uh, there was a curious circumstance I meant to ask you about at once. Yes? Uh, the two young men who discovered the fire report that there was another person. A man or a woman? Oh, a man! What would a woman be doing there? Oh, I... A man! It was proceeding along a ditch beside the road. There were, of course, not uh, certain that this man had any connection with the case, of course. But, uh, what did this man look like? Did he give his name? Oh, no, no. There was practically no conversation with him, and he hurried away. He's not been seen since. Do you have his description? Uh, yes, yes, I have the description given by the young man who saw him. <laughs> it was quite a bright moonlight night, as you remember. <laughs> if indeed the moon does shine in London. The description, please. Uh, age, about 35 or 6. He wore no hat. That could be anyone. A dark man, weighing about 11 stone, wearing a checkered waistcoat. <gasps> huh? My husband was wearing a checkered waistcoat. Uh -huh. uh, a dark red tie. And he wore a dark red tie. Yeah, I'd best call these young men to see if they can remember any more details about Go this. Go on with the description, please. Oh, yes. Uh, the man had a small black moustache, a wart on the left side of his neck, mm. a cut on his right hand. No. And bulgy eyes. Mm. Uh, Popeyes, the young man said, and dark curly hair. <laughs> and he limped his right foot. He limped. His left foot, Sergeant. Huh? He limped with his left foot. He was wounded in the war in 1916. He limped with his left foot. Do you mean to say you recognize this man, Mrs. Padgett? Of course I do. Who? He's the man you thought was burned to death in the motor car. Who? My husband, Donald Padgett. But Mrs. Padgett! So Don's added murder to his other sins at last, has he? The reporters, the self-styled crime men, pounced on the story by mid-afternoon and flung their headline broadcasts from Land's End to John O'Groat's house. Before nightfall on the 6th of November, a third of the people of England, Scotland and Wales were peering into the faces of perfect strangers, hoping for a glimpse of... Donald Patrick Paget, the proclaimed fugitive. At Scotland Yard, we went a little more slowly. We weren't as certain as the newspapers. They got me an impression of the dead man's teeth, and when it arrived, I dispatched it to one Clement Walter, who was Paget's dentist of record. Mr. Walter telephoned me at the yard at ten minutes after eight, the night of the sixth. Is that Inspector Clark? Yes, Clark speaking. The Walter here. Walter? The dentist, man. Patchett's dentist. I should think you'd know my voice by now. Oh, sorry, Mr. Walter. Uh, did you have anything to report? Uh, that impression of your precious dead man's teeth. Yes? Uh, they're nothing at all like Donald Paget's. Really? I've checked exhaustively through all my rather extensive records. It has taken a great deal of time. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, it's quite impossible that the dead man's teeth could be those of Paget's. I would be glad to demonstrate to you at your convenience... But if you could have the actual teeth, I could show you more graphically. All right, sir. Thank you very kindly. Uh, my fee will be, in view of the fact that this work has been done after hours, one guinea, sir. I am sure that the Home Office will consider it money well spent, sir. Good night. Sergeant Talbot. Coming, sir. I was just about to come in, sir. Do so, by all means. Yes, sir. I've checked four persons so far, sir. Well? I asked each one to give me his own description of Paget, sir. And they're all his close acquaintances. 
And? Well, they all agree in detail with that given by the two young men at Harvingstone. The hatless man climbing out of the ditch. Each one of them said independently that Paget was one of those odd chaps who's never been known to wear a hat winter or summer. Looks as if he's our boy, then. Uh, wait a sec, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, Nobby, uh, Inspector Clark, here. Mrs. Pamela Paget here to see you, sir. Oh? Well, ask her to come in. Shall I ask the other lady to come in, too, sir? Eh? Who's she? Miss Ellen Mac... Who's she? Don't know, sir. She is with Mrs. Paget. Oh, all right. Send her in, too. Yes, sir. Ever heard of an Ellen, Mac Ellen McEachran, Talbot? No, sir. There was an Alice McEachran, sir, pickpocket. She was struck by a tram last Tuesday in Hammersmith Broadway. She was killed. Talbot, you're a mine of information. I doubt this is the same one, though. No, sir. That all, sir. Yes, thank you. For now... Is this Inspector Clark's office, please? Uh, right here, Mrs. Paget. Come in. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Come in, my child. Inspector Clark, this is Miss Ellen McEachran. How do you do, Miss McEachran? Won't you, you be seated? Thank you. Well, Mrs. Paget, I'm afraid that it was your husband. I was certain it was. Yes. I had just come back from Hardingstone, and I went straight away to find Ellen. <laughs> Excuse me, Mum. I'm afraid I don't understand, Mrs. Paget. Do sit still, Ellen. Yes, Mum. That bald-headed sergeant up there, what's his name? Sergeant Moody. Oh, Moody, that's it. He said something when we were talking about not being sure whether the body in the fire was a man or a woman. He told me that on the telephone this afternoon. Apparently, they're sure, sure now that it was a man. The medical officer... Yes, I know. But I didn't know when I came back. That's why I went to find Ellen here. <laughs> she thought perhaps it might be me. But it wasn't, was it? No, child, it wasn't. Neither you nor your father. I'm afraid I know. <laughs> Father's still in jail. You can't burn up people in jail, now can you, sir? Will you tell me... Uh, tell me what you're talking about, Mrs. Paget. What has this child and her father got to do with the... I was afraid it was Ellen MacDonald had murdered. Oh, my father, you said. Why, for <laughs> heaven's sake? Well, Ellen's father had threatened to do bodily harm to Donald. He uh, threatened to break his bloody neck! Oh, pardon me. Eh? Why? Because he wasn't paying the 20 shillings a week he'd agreed to pay, of course. Well, what 20 shillings? <laughs> for my baby. What? The father of Ellen's three-year-old child is Donald Paget, Inspector Clark. John Davidson, from the Black Museum, shared a pint of mild and bitter with me that night after I finally shut up shop. <clears throat> I don't know, John, I said. About what? About people. No accounting for tapes. Yeah, fine original statement, that. Eh? True, though. You were speaking about the wife. Yes. Married to this fellow. He goes out and contracts the bigamous, bigamous marriage. To a girl who's an obvious idiot, you said. Well, not very clever. Maid servant, you said. What we used to call a slavey. Fortunately, that class is disappearing. Doesn't help the ones that are left, John. Yeah, the Paget class never does that. Uh... I shall do my best to assure this one's dying out. Uh, we were talking about his wife. Yes. She apparently doesn't have any resentment toward this young, uh, what's her name, Ellen? Ellen. Why should she? It wasn't Ellen's fault that she has the mentality of a mango woozle. Any resentment she harbors is towards her husband. The missing Donald Patrick Paget Esquire who lit one too many bonfires on Guy Fawkes Day. For which, God willing, he'll hang. Do you have any ideas regarding the unfortunate man in the car? None. Well, I know nothing about it, Nobby. Mm -hmm. But knowing nothing about it, I may have an idea. What? The lawful wife may have an idea, too. Mrs. Paget? I. Explain, please, John... If a man commits, what shall we call it, uh, an indiscretion like this, 
marrying bigamously and fathering a child. The law of the land calls it a felony. For the purpose of my argument, let's disregard the legality of the thing, Nobby. Now, we have here the situation of a husband committing a grave offense against his wife. And the law. Disregard the law. <laughs> Empirically, I mean. He commits this heinous crime. The wife, practicing true Christian forbearance and charity, forgives the man. Or at least declines to prosecute him. Well? Now, bear with me. Given that set of circumstances, would not such a man be inclined to repeat the offense? Well, uh, having convinced himself that he'll be allowed, as our American cousins say, allowed to get away with it again. It could be, John. Assuring himself that he need only to satisfy his wife's goodness of soul, her love for him, which she has demonstrated, and the payment to the unfortunate young woman of a sum of money proposed by the courts. Well, I don't see where your argument's going, John, but... It's not a bad argument, Nobby. And it follows out the one advanced by Mrs. Paget. Assume that the wrong girl's father threatens unpleasantness to Brother Paget. Oh, you're saying that the dead man may be the father of still another victimized girl. That doesn't sound reasonable. Well, I... Mrs. Paget was convinced it was reasonable in the case of young uh, Ellen, is it? She's forgiven a lot, but she boggles at the thought of murder. So for that matter do I. What do you think? Why, well, I think if I were doing it, I, I'd look about and see if the temporarily missing Mr. Paget has made any other excursions into the extramarital, and then I'd discover whether the father of the bride is enjoying good health or has recently been the victim of an all-consuming fire. And then I should order another half pint for poor old John Davidson, who is now extremely thirsty. John Davidson's ingenious idea was almost right. Mrs. Paget knew of no other liaisons with women of any age, intellectual state, or social standing which had been contracted by her husband. We have been horribly unhappy, Inspector, during all of our married life. But I have tried to make allowances. Donald was severely wounded in the war. He was buried alive at Festubert. They despaired of his life for a long, long time. I didn't know about that. He was such a wonderful person, Inspector, before we were married and he went to France. At first, Hubert, only three months after he went overseas, I didn't... Well, I made a vow to myself that if Don recovered and got well, I'd... I don't want to talk about it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Patrick. I swore to myself that no matter what happened, no matter what he did, I would try. I... I'm sorry, Mrs. Paget, but... He's been unfaithful to me so many times. But this time with Ellen was the only one I knew all about. I was afraid Ellen's father was... Don's mind was affected, you know by that dreadful wound. He makes mistakes. He does things. He can't hold on to a job. We haven't any money. I've tried so hard, Inspector. But not... Not murder. Not murder. Even if it is Donald. That's why I came to you. If it's murder... Not even for Donnie. <laughs> I went away from there back to my office. It was the morning of the 7th of November, less than, two thir uh, than 32 hours since the young men had found the blazing car. 
There was a telegraph form in its envelope on my desk. I looked at it from Cardiff in Wales. Tore open the envelope. Signature. Arthur Llewellyn. I don't know any Arthur Llewellyn. What's the message say? Donald Patrick Paddett will arrive at Hammersmith bus terminal at 9.30 p.m. today the 7th. Important you meet him. You will recognize him from his description, Arthur Llewellyn. John Davidson, it appeared, was wrong. I telephoned him to say so. I didn't telephone Mrs. Paget. 9.30 that night, I met Donald Paget as he stepped off the Cardiff bus. It was easy to recognize him. We went in a CID car to my office and talked. I'd given up, Inspector, anyhow. It can't be done. I wonder if I could see my wife. She's in, waiting in the ante room. You can see her if you want to. She wants to after we get this over. All right. I did it. Very well. Donald Patrick Paget, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder and warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Sergeant Talbot, do you have your notebook? Yes, sir. I'm ready. I'll make a statement. I had to do it. First, I got rid of nearly every penny of money we had. I spent it on women funny to say that when I love Pamela. I love poor Pamela and I treated her so badly. Just women. I don't drink, I don't smoke. But women find me attractive, I'm afraid, and I'm their undoing. And mine. And Pamela's. Yes, and that kid of Ellen's. I couldn't pay the building society on the house. They, they'd have thrown us out in another month. I couldn't pay Ellen. Or McEachern have had me in jail. It was just the end of things for me. And for Pamela. So I picked him up when he asked for a lift. I poured petrol all over him after I strangled him and I stuffed him into the driver's seat. Then I got out and poured a trail of petrol down the road to the car and lighted it. And then I remembered I'd locked him in. I tried to run back to the car, but it was too late. I ran back and down the ditch, and that was when those boys saw me. The game was up. I'd intended to run away and be listed as dead in a motor car accident, and Pamela would get the insurance. But they'd seen me. I did run away. It isn't very clear to me, I'm afraid. I, I went to Cardiff. I went to see a girl I used to know. Gladys Llewellyn but she was gone and her brother Arthur saw me he hated me for some reason did he telegraph you? Mm -hmm. I knew I was done for can I see Pamela now? please all right sergeant oh wait there's one more thing I don't know who he was the man I murdered he was a complete stranger. He just happened along at the right time. I don't know his name. I'm sorry about him. But I'm sorry about so many things. Now may I see Pamela? All right, Sergeant. Hello, Pam, darling. Hello, darling. Oh, Pamela... I'm so sorry. I've brought you some of the cigarettes you like. Donnie. The identity of the dead man was never learned. Donald Patrick Paget was tried at the Bedford Assizes and found guilty of murder. On the 10th of March, 1931, he was hanged at Bedford Prison. Prepare today on Whitehall 1212 in the order of their appearance, Harvey Hayes, Jared Burke, Gord Stern... Lester Fletcher, Basil Langton, 
Francois Grimard, Beulah Garrick, Patricia Courtley, and Victor Chapin. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> Because blood has been available in Korea until now, many, many lives have been saved. However, the present rate of donations is far below that needed to build up our reserve supplies. 